now, let me see. Oh, Ambassador Brhanek just came in. Okay, let's start. Uh, let me see. It's already uh, to. Okay. Um, welcome, Ambassador Brhanek. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ephraim. And, uh, hello, everybody. How are you all? Let me introduce them, Ambassador Brhanek. Uh, okay, you have here our dear friend Vicky Huddleston, Ambassador Vicky Huddleston. Um, you probably know her personally. Sure. Ambassador Tim Clark, you know him not too, Ambassador Brani. Ambassador Tim Clark, say hello. <laughs> um, Ambassador Yamamoto, you, you know Ambassador Yamamoto, say hello to Ambassador Yamamoto. Then Ambassador Christie uh, from Finland, no? Yeah. Am I right? Yes. Yes, Ambassador Christie. <laughs> And then we have here, uh, oh, Dr. Eleni Gabramedhin, whose house was recently investigated, just joined us. <laughs> Ambassador Tlahun, uh, um, uh, Professor Tlahun, uh, Professor Tlahun. Um, I think, let me see, there are a couple other people who said they'll be coming. Shall we start or uh, shall we just wait a couple more minutes? Dr. Tadasa Wuhib from the, uh, CDC, Center for Disease Control. He is, he is actually more or less, <coughs> he and I work together daily on the peace in Ethiopia. Uh, Dr. Tadis, uh, Ambassador Bakalagalata has just shown up. He's the former, uh, so you know him, don't you, Ambassador Brani? Ambassador Bakalagalata, who used to be the head of the CD, uh, the um, Red Cross. Uh, and uh, who is iPhone? This iPhone. Uh, who is the iPhone? Uh, it's it's me, Professor. It's Achi. Oh, oh, yeah. There's a Princeton University graduate who works for uh, for uh, Microsoft, and she works with me on uh, Africa piece. Anyway, so well, I think we should maybe start first of all. Uh, I oh, did I introduce Ambassador Stefan Gompers? Is here, Ambassador Gompers, Ambassador Stefan. Did I mention you? Uh, I didn't. Okay. Anyway, thank uh, it, you. It, it, it doesn't matter. We're all about friends. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, well, uh -huh. Welcome, welcome, Mr. Stefan. You said your friend you. from Ad Addis will join us. Is he going to join us? No, no. Unfortunately, he has a commitment. Okay. Next time. Oh. What, about, what about Bob Doer? Uh, he is. Ambassador Doer is here. I don't see him. I can't see I, him. I saw him before. Oh. Okay. I don't think so. I saw him, and all of a sudden, uh, let me see, he was here. <coughs> Ambassador Stephen said, Ambassador Drawer was there, but then he disappeared. I saw him. Uh, what, what happened? Didn't I introduce him before when I spoke? Uh, not really. I thought he was there. He usually shows up. Yes. And uh, Rafael Dil. Shall, I, shall oh. I call him? Would you like to call him Ambassador Stefan? Ambassador Doha? Sure. Would you give him a call? Uh, and here is another member of our peace committee. Kulani Jalata is she worked for the US Congress. She's a lawyer. She also went to Princeton and Harvard. Uh, that, that's the, the only people from my committee who are here. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Professor Ephraim. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Bob. How are you? Are you joining us tonight? Are you joining? Joining us, joining the meeting with the Professor Ephraim. Oh, well, we just we, we just started. Uh, well, it's um, seven. It must be seven thirty London time, two thirty Eastern Standard Time. Yes, we just. Uh, Should I send it back to you? Okay, I will. 
Well, he's, Bob Dewar is on a call, but he'll join us as soon as possible. Okay, then shall we start? Yes. Okay, well, let me first of all introduce uh, to you all uh, our distinguished guest today, Ambassador Brahani Gabra Christos. Ambassador Brahani Gabra Christos, uh, before I introduce his title, let me say he's also a personal friend, a very good friend, a person whom I respect, and I'm very happy that he today agreed to come and uh, meet us. Uh, Ambassador Brahani, uh, I met him first when, uh, do, before the end of the uh, Derg War, uh, when he used to come to Washington. And, uh, since then, that's almost 30 years we've known each other. Then Ambassador Brahani um, was actually officiating at the meeting that happened in Addis, uh, the Peace and Tra Democratic Transitional Committee. And uh, I remember his coming to me at the back of the stage asking me to say a few words at the conclusion of that meeting. Uh, so we've been really very close friends who've known each other and I have great respect for him and for his intelligence. Um, ambassador Brahane was the first uh, um, ambassador of uh, the EPRDF to uh, United States uh, from 1991 and for another five years there. And then thereafter, he was the Ethiopian ambassador to the European Union. Uh, so you all know that. Um, and uh, he had served in many uh, very important uh, capacity with the EPRDF. And today, uh, Ambassador Brahani will correct me if I introduce him as uh, a, a chief representative of the um, uh, TDF or TPLF uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so ha if I made a mistake, Ambassador Brahani, you can correct me. So we're going to hear from Ambassador Brahani uh, get his insights and in enlightenment. Ambassador Brahani, if I made a mistake in introducing you, please forgive me. No problem. I think you've uh, introduced me correctly, so no problem with that. I will go with that. Okay, thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, well, I do represent the government of Tigray at this moment. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, because of the, you know, I have... Uh, I left government in 2018, uh, and uh, I never meant to go back to this kind of work, but uh, due to the circumstances that have been created in Ethiopia, and in particular in Tigray, due to the genocide that's taking place, I uh, couldn't resist uh, and I couldn't contain myself uh, from not taking part. So I took part uh, in elevating the genocidal acts that are taking place in Tigray and in Ethiopia. So that's what I am doing currently. Uh, well, thank you very much, Professor Ephraim, for uh, inviting me. I really uh, highly appreciate that. And uh, definitely thank you as well for everything that you have been doing throughout your life. You have been working very hard to uh, make sure that Ethiopia remains peaceful, stable, uh, and you have contributed greatly uh, throughout your life. At least uh, we met over 30 years ago. And uh, every time I meet with you, you have been uh, looking into how peace could be consolidated in Ethiopia. So thank you for uh, that service. Thank you. And, uh, great meeting you, great seeing you all. Uh, I have almost, uh, you know, I have worked with almost uh, all of you, all, I can say almost all of you, uh, and uh, very, uh, uh, very, you know, it's, uh, it's a great uh, occasion for me uh, to reconnect with some of you and to see you again after a while. So uh, thank you for, uh, as well, I would like to thank you as well for the service that you gave. Uh, to your nations uh, and to the institutions that you represented in Ethiopia. I think you worked very hard to strengthen the relationships. And at the same time, I should recognize that during your tenure, you have contributed greatly to Ethiopia's miraculous economic development and to the tackling of poverty, where Ethiopia tackled around over 30% of poverty uh, during more or less adding up during your tenures. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, the concerns that you showed them, the support that you showed them, and the contribution that you have uh, on at least improving livelihood of the Ethiopian people. So we are very grateful for, uh, for that. Uh, so having said that, I think I'm going to be, I'll try to be brief. This is a vast area and uh, it touches a lot of feelings as well. Uh, so, but I'll try to be extremely brief and I'll, I'll try to deal with what happened the last three years very briefly and try to see the way out. Uh, I think you'd be, since you're very familiar with Ethiopia, not only familiar with Ethiopia, since uh, you're really a part of it and you've been following the situation and uh, your commitment has been demonstrated with the meetings that you have nearly every week or once uh, every two weeks and uh, only on this forum, but on other forums you've been taking part in this as well. So taking into consideration, I will focus, I'll try to focus on the on the future. At, at any rate, the problem of Ethiopia, as you know, uh, the Ethiopians, uh, the problem that we Ethiopians are facing today is essentially political. Essentially political, I should uh, re-emphasize on that. And the major uh, contentious or burning issue is the state building. There are two schools of thoughts, as you know. Uh, one is there are Ethiopians who are passionate about uh, having a unitarian state and an assimilationist state. There are Ethiopians who are passionate as well on federalism. So here is the evolution of power and centralization of power. This has been contentious uh, for a long, long, long time in Ethiopia's history because of, of our diversity and so on. I don't want to go into that details. At any rate, this is the issue that we have been confronted today in Ethiopia. Uh, we put mechanisms, not a perfect one, but mechanism and framework that would allow us to address these issues peacefully. I think we have, uh, we came up with a constitution, we came up with laws that could, that would enable us to address these burning issues, these contentious issues peacefully. Um, at any rate, uh, the mechanisms didn't work, the framework didn't work. What happened is when Prime Minister Abiy came to power. His sole interest, in my opinion, in my sincere opinion, uh, his sole interest was consolidation of power around himself. I repeat, around himself. And for this to happen, he had to look for a social peace, for a social group that supports this. And bear in mind, he came from a federalist camp. He came from Oromia. He came from the Opidio. He came into power through a federalist, uh, basically federalist party or a coalition, uh, the EPRD. When he came to power, he wanted to consolidate power around himself. Then he had to look for a social base he found out that the ultra Amhara nationalists were the base for this. Why? Their interest has always been, has been um, having a unitarian state and an assimilationist state. In order to have consolidation of power, power has to be centralized. So these two interests matched. So he switched his social base from the federalist area, from the federalist uh, sector into the unionist and assimilationist camp. 
Well, in order to have his centralization, the two, in order to have centralization and unionist and uh, uh, assimilationist, assimilationist uh, state, they had to abolish the constitution. And they had to abolish federalism because federalism entails devolution of power. Devolution of power and centralization of power do not go together. So they wanted to abolish this and this created a lot of chaos. Why? Let's see the steps that they took. The first step that they took was they first, you know, they wanted to do this in an unconstitutional manner by abolishing the constitution and by force. The first action that they took was in the Somali region. They unseated the uh, government then militarily and put a loyal uh, government to the prime minister who would work with the union, uh, unionist or centralist uh, venture. Then the next step was Tigray. Prime Minister Avi sent a commando unit to imprison the Tigrayan leaders. This was immediately after he came to power, after a few months. What happened was the commando unit that came to unseat or to imprison the Tigrayan leaders were apprehended at the airport and were kept in Tigray for two months. Then they were sent back to Addis after two months, after having negotiations and uh, asking for clarifications. Then he continued changing the government, the regional governments, and replacing him, replacing them with his followers and with his uh, friends. That's what he did in order to create a centralist uh, system of governance. The major obstacle to this was definitely he did it in the South, as you might remember, he went to Awasa and he gathered the leaders. There was an incident in uh, Awasa city. He went to visit uh, uh, Awasa immediately after that incident and he informed the leaders that they should unseat themselves and resign themselves. In his flight from Awasa, to Elaita Sordo. That's 15, 20 minutes flight, maximum of 15 minutes flight, I guess, because it's in the same region. As he was flying to, uh, to uh, Elaita Sordo, the officials resigned, the party leaders and the government leaders in the region resigned. So that they paved the way for him to appoint his uh, um, I should say friends I need it, at any rate. This is how he uh, unseat the governments and try to consolidate uh, power around himself. The major obstacle to this was the guy. Why? Uh, I don't have to go into the details, you'd understand that. The guy fought for 17 years from 75 until 1991, around 17 years for decentralization. There were around 60,000, over 60,000 people that sacrificed their lives, over 100,000 that lost parts of their bodies. And a lot of destruction happened during this war. So definitely it would not be easy to reverse devolution of power or federalism integrate. So he started preparing himself to invade Tigray since the first day. So there were a lot of pressures that were undertaken, including closure of roads and so on and so forth. At any rate, uh, as you all uh, remember, uh, after all these uh, actions, I think the on uh, uh, the government worked very hard to mobilize uh, defense forces. Prime Minister himself has uh, informed the parliament the type of preparations he made. He mobilized, you know, the agreement with Eritrea was a pact. He brought the UAE into his fold. 
He brought the Somali troops uh, into his fold. So Tigray was invaded, encircled, completely encircled by entire Ethiopian defense forces that were mobilized to the Tigrayan border, by Eritrean, 100% Eritrean defense forces, UAE drones, and Somali 3,000 troops, and Amhara forces. Literally, four nations invaded Tigray. I should say five with the Amhara region invaded Tigray. Uh, this is what uh, happened. Uh, so as you can see what it means with all these capabilities and all these things. Uh, I don't want to go into bore you with the consequence of war, uh, you, to your, uh, which everybody knows, uh, the genocide, sexual violence, looting, pillaging, destruction that took place. All this uh, happened. Uh, what I can tell you is Tigray has is now uh, taken has been taken to Stone Age. It is literally nothing that exists there, uh, and definitely uh, I will talk about the blockade later, indicated blockade later. At any rate, this is what happened. Let me tell you the military situation, current military situation. I don't want to bore you with what happened in the last three years. Everybody, every one of you are very familiar. I just wanted to put the context that we are talking about. The military situation is that TDF, when this war started, they had around 9,000 police and locally armed um, <clears throat> Uh, armed uh, farmers and so on that would serve the local administrations as volunteers and as police. So totally they had 9,000. That's what they had. General Sarkhan has as well stated that. So it's 9,000 that fought with five nations. I'm, <laughs> I'm indicating as well the Amhara region as one nation. There are actually four UN-recognized nations. So uh, at any rate, uh, what we can say about the war and about Tigray is Tigray managed to build an army that could counter all these forces within two to three months. That's all. For me, this is unique in military history. I should say, because to build a military machinery, it does not mean train soldiers. It means build the institution, build leaders, build fighters. That's what it means. And make sure that they function as an institution. So in Tigray, defense force was established that could counter four nations, five, the fifth one being the one of the regions. Later, the prime minister engaged the 10 more regions, money to establish a defense force within two to three months. This is unique in my, in my opinion. I think the circumstances and the other factors forced Tigray to do this because of the type of genocide that was taking place on the ground. People were committed, people stood as one, uh, and uh, managed to build an army within two to three months. This is unique in history, in my opinion. There were armies that were built within a short period of time, but in modern times, uh, confronting all these forces is. Uh, unimaginable for me, at least. At the moment, what we can say militarily is that the Ethiopian Defense Force has been completely decimated. It's a small percentage that they have at this time. Uh, it's not an exaggeration. The army that we have, the national level is full of 
farmers, ill-trained farmers that were given arms to fight. In some cases, farmers and young people coming with machete. This is a kind of army that uh, Ethiopia has at this time. The regime is trying to mobilize hundreds of thousands of civilians, at the same time importing the most sophisticated weaponry from many parts of the world, including from new nations that they started to purchase armaments from, like Iran, Turkey, Azerbaijan, and others as well. Uh, the traditional ones, this, uh, Russia, China, and so on are there. So they, are, they have been uh, deploying sophisticated technologies and armaments, which they don't have people to man them. In some cases, they are using mercenaries. Uh, so well, at this time, uh, the uh, TDF is in Northern Shoah, uh, crossing all the Amhara area and getting into the Oromo land. Uh, here, people are extremely supportive to the TDF with no exaggeration. They're extremely supportive without the support of the Amhara people and the Afar people. It would have been impossible, absolutely impossible to, to operate there. You can see that even the speed of movement, the type of support is uh, immense. I should say, because the TDF has been disciplined, they know what they are doing. And I don't want to go into that detail. I just wanted to indicate that. The political situation, I should, uh, I would like to mention a few points here. Uh, the government of Tigray repeatedly called on peaceful resolution of the problem, starting, I mean, pre-war, starting pre-war. Uh, as you might recall, the coalition of Ethiopian Federalist Forces came up with a proposal of settling problems in Ethiopia. This is prior to, you know, prior to the war. The war started in November, but in September 2020, they came up with a proposal. Then the Tigray government came up with two, three proposals, some comprehensive proposal for peace, some for ceasefire. So has been calling consistently for uh, peaceful uh, resolution on the part of the government of uh, Abi. There's been consistent rejection. Uh, as you all know, the international community tried to convince uh, Prime Minister Abi and his government, uh, the US, EU, African Union sent uh, elder uh, leaders as well, as you all know. Uh, IGAD uh, tried and nothing happened uh, due to uh, lack of cooperation from a part of the government. Why are they refusing peaceful resolution? I should say something about this. This is because they have committed so, so, so much heinous crimes. Going to peace talk means addressing the problems. Addressing the problems ultimately will lead into accountability. So Isaias and Abi do not want to go to this process. This is the sole reason why they don't want to do that. As you see, the world has been trying to bring solution to Ethiopia's problem. The world, even look at some of the statements uh, coming from great powers, coming from institutions, trying to indicate to the prime minister that he should be forthcoming, trying to encourage him to come into a path of, you know, peaceful resolution, consistently refuse. It's because the level of crimes that they have committed would not allow them. They would rather go to the end. That's, I think, the, uh, one of the characteristics of uh, genocide years. If they begin it, they have to finish it. Uh, this is what experts as well say. And for this reason, uh, the government has not been forthcoming. 
So I would like to inform you another development is that the United Front of Ethiopian Federalist and Confederalist Forces has been created. Uh, there are nine uh, groups that have uh, taken part in here. Um, the Afar, Ago, Benishangul Command, Somali, the Oromo, OLF, OLA, Sidama, Gambilla, Tigray. These are the groups that have come together to form uh, a united front. Uh, they have shared beliefs, uh, as, I, I, as I said, they have shared belief on democracy, equality, and self-determination. They want to address few important, I, 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 I'd like to mention some of the concerns that they have and some of the concerns that they have and they want to address. They want to, uh, they want to address the deteriorating security situation of the country. This is one of their concerns. Secondly, they want to bring an end to the deliberate attempt by Abiy regime to drive Ethiopia into all-out inter-Sign war. Thirdly, they want to ensure a peaceful transition in the aftermath of the, the demise of the current government. Fourthly, they, they want to ensure an all-inclusive political, uh, political dialogue takes place then. These are the, for me, these are the four most important tasks that the United Front uh, has undertaken. The members have agreed on some issues. They have agreed to have an all-round coordination against the regime in Addis. Uh, they have agreed to form security arrangement if and when needed. Uh, bear in mind, there is no defense capability in Ethiopia today. There is no defense force. There are militias. That's what we have uh, on the part of the uh, Abiy administration. All have agreed to ensure that Eritrean and other foreign military forces and security personnel exit from Ethiopia. And they agreed to work jointly towards an all-inclusive political dialogue and establishment of a transitional arrangement. These are the tasks that they have uh, undertaken. On the way forward, uh, I think the collapse of Abiy regime will definitely create a security vacuum at the center and stabilizing the country in the aftermath of the removal of the genocidal regime requires putting in place a provisional structure until we have a transitional arrangement. So there will be a provisional uh, administration uh, established for a very short period of time. And then through the all, uh, through all inclusive political dialogue, we'll have a transitional uh, setup or a transitional arrangement. This is uh, uh, the way forward that uh, we envisage. Uh, and this should come into place as soon as possible. And there has been consultation taking place amongst different political parties so that every one of them, there will be no exclusion. Uh, definitely the exclusion will be with PP, uh, with the Prosperity Party, because if they are defeated, if they come, if they come to their senses and engage uh, in a peaceful resolution of the problem, definitely they, can, they could have been part of it. If they are defeated militarily, then the, the PP will have no place. The rest of them, with no exclusion, everybody will take part in the uh, uh, national dialogue, and then a traditional arrangement will be established. This is how we see that we have to overcome problems in Ethiopia. Unless we do this, unless we have a, an all-inclusive political process, it will not be possible to stabilize like, uh, like a country like Ethiopia, which is extremely diverse uh, in many aspects. So this is uh, what I wanted to say. This is, uh, uh, I hope, uh, 
I have touched on some issues that would enable us to, to interact. And so if there are uh, comments, you know, I would like to hear as well your comments and uh, we can exchange the views on, uh, on the issues that I mentioned or issues that uh, I didn't mention. So thank you so much for uh, listening to me and uh, we, can, we can exchange views. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ambassador Brani, for this very uh, detailed, uh, uh, clear uh, summary, our pressy of the events. Uh, we thank you very much. Now, um, I don't know, Ambassador Dewar still has not shown up, has he? He said he was going to come, but I don't see him. Um, Ambassador Stefan, is he, have, he said he will come, no? Yeah, yes, he did. But he... Yeah, I had a call before. I can I can try and call him again, but yeah, yeah, because I know he was interested. Ambassador, Rafa Ambassador uh, Rafael said he's coming, but I don't see him either. You know, he sent an email saying he's coming. Yes, he told me he would try and come. Mm -hmm. He wasn't sure he could whether he could make it or not. You want to give Ambassador Jawar one more call? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, well, in the meantime. Let me say, um, Ambassador Brahani, really thank you so very, very much. And uh, I myself learned a lot today from what you said. So now um, maybe we can start uh, dialoguing. The dialogue would be with our guest ambassadors, my friends, my committee members. We can, we can listen in uh, un unless there's some urgent uh, reaction. All right. He didn't answer? No. No, I'll try in a few minutes again. Okay, thank you. So let's now uh, open the floor for, for, for dialogue, discussion. Well, can, can I start? Yes, please. Please, Ambassador. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and thank you, Ambassador Berani, for the very interesting statement. Uh, I know you're in frequent touch with my good friend Jean-Christophe Jean -Christophe Belia, who was my successor in Addis Ababa. He's a very good friend of mine. Uh, I have a couple of uh, uh, questions. First, regarding the, the present situation. Uh, what do you think of the uh, attempt by, by the uh, African Union uh, at establishing a channel of negotiations, particularly Obazanjo? Because I understand that at the beginning, you were a bit reluctant to accept a Byzantine mission, but now perhaps uh, the uh, the opposition has softened it a, a, a bit. Uh, second question regarding the uh, present situation. Um, the US called for restraint in military operations, and especially on your part. What are the, the TDF going to do with this uh, America, uh, call by the US? <clears throat> and uh, finally, um, let's suppose, I don't think it's very likely, but let's suppose tomorrow, Prime Minister Abi says, okay, let's sit around the table and talk. Would you accept him as an interlocutor? This is the first group of questions. Then I have some questions for the, what you said, what you described as the uh, interim in period after perhaps a military solution if there's no, there's no negotiation. Um, if the transitional government into input is put into place, what do you think you will do with the other institutions like parliament, the president of the Republic, our good friend Salih Wakzaude, the president of the electoral commission, will they remain in place? Would they, will they have to play a role? That's my first question. Second question, how do you think you control the issue of accountability, which you very aptly described? Uh, because, as you said yourself, this might be a deterrent for the people who is in power, who are in power uh, at present, because they might be afraid that they have, to, they would have to be held accountable. Uh, so, do you envisage some kind of uh, justice mechanism or reconciliation? Could you give us some details? I mean, we know there are presidents, like in Rwanda, for instance. Um, last but not least, what are you? How are you going to deal with Eritrea and Isaias? 
your good friend Isaias. Thank you. You're mute, Ambassador. You're mute. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Ambassador. You've raised uh, very important and pertinent uh, issues. Uh, first, in regards to President Obasanjo, President Obasanjo is a good friend of Ethiopia. And he has uh, he's been he's, uh, a highly respected personality uh, in, uh, in, in Ethiopia. So there has never been a problem uh, with him mediating. Uh, however, the Tigray government had, uh, 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 was not happy, I should say. The Tigray government has not been happy with the African Union. Uh, the African Union being in Addis didn't do much. Not only that, the chair of the commission uh, made a statement to the effect that he would support the, uh, at the beginning of the war, he stated that he supported the law and uh, order uh, uh, enforcement actions taken by uh, Abi. Um, so this was just... Uh, displeasure, nothing else. Uh, we're not rejecting even the African Union. We cannot reject the African Union. We cannot reject uh, or oppose uh, Prime uh, President uh, Obasanjo. So we have been cooperating with uh, President Obasanjo from day one, and he, he, and he wanted to reach out uh, to the Tigray government. The Tigray government responded very positively. He's been received warmly in Magala, uh, and they had very fruitful and good discussions as well. From the Tigray part, there has been logical, reasonable, rational issues that have been presented to him. How we see the problems of Ethiopia should be addressed. Uh, how we see the problems in Tigray would be addressed. So there has been good discussions, as far as we are concerned, very constructive, very uh, fruitful discussions has been taking uh, place with uh, President Obasanjo. Not only with President Obasanjo, with all the interlo interlocutors that have reached out to us, we have given every one of them positive response. And we have tried to explain ourselves. We have tried to explain the sufferings that the people of Tigray are going through. And we have tried to explain how these problems can be overcome. So on the part of Tigray, Tigray has been very, very forthcoming and responsible uh, in this sense. Uh, in regards to the, the second question is in regards to the U.S. Um, uh, uh, calling for uh, uh, restraints. We appreciate that. I think it's uh, a very uh, good intention. It is uh, a call with good intention, a call that uh, would save Ethiopia. This was along with our belief in Tigray. We believe that war will devastate Ethiopia not only devastate, it's bringing, as a matter of fact, implosion of Ethiopia. This implosion is not going to be confined to Ethiopia, but it's going to have uh, great ramification in the region. We have no interest in this at all. No interest of whatsoever, it's because it's destruction. We benefit and our people benefit from peace. So when uh, we are called and there are calls for peace, we uh, strongly support them and we give them maximum support. So the US call has been good, but what happened is you have to understand where we are. You have to understand the circumstances where today is. First and foremost, 
genocide is taking place at full swing against Tigrayans. Uh, you know, people have people killed in thousands. They're just moving them in villages, in towns, and so on. So many people have been killed. So much destruction has taken place. It's a total war. Total war by four nations against a small region, a small people, a minority people. Look what's happening to people in Addis. Look what, is ha what happened even to my dear sister, Eleni. Her house was searched yesterday. Yesterday or the day, two, a couple of days ago, I think. The reason is no reason at all. First of all, she's not a Tigrayan. Second, but <laughs> above all, her name is Tigrayan. It could go for Tigrayan. It's not only Tigrayan, but it would go, it would go very, very well for Tigrayan. So they just took her name and searched her house and mistreated her, her dad and her family. This is what's happening in Ethiopia. So one, genocide is taking place. Two, the government, Abis government and Isaias government, since they lost the war in Tigray, they put a siege on Tigray, blocked Tigray effectively. A single tablet is not sleeping into, is not getting into Tigray. A single tablet. People are dying due to lack of medicine, lack of food, lack of services, and so on. Lack of humanitarian assistance, a disaster that's created by the government. So there is a blockade. Thirdly, the government has been mobilizing hundreds of thousands of civilians to invade the Grai, not only invade, to continue with the genocidal venture. So what would the Grai do? We are willing to stop, you know, because it's good for Ethiopia, it's good for all Ethiopians, including for Tigrayans. But under these circumstances, what do we do? We have to break the, at least break the blockade. That's what we are trying to do. We have to break the blockade. And if, you know, our friends, uh, the international community can stop the genocide, can end the blockade, can stop the preparation for uh, uh, genocidal acts, we'd be extremely happy to, to stop. Because that's what we want. So uh, this is the situation. I think as far as uh, this continues, it will be very difficult for the people of Tigray because they are pushed to the, to the, against the world. And uh, they have no choice except defending themselves. They are simply defending themselves. They are defending themselves from genocide. I think this has to be uh, realized. If the third one is, if Abi agrees, what would we do? Well, we'd accept it. We'd talk to him. But there are things that need to be done. He has to stop the genocide. He has to stop the crime. He has to end the blockade, allow electricity, trade, and so on and so forth. Open telecom. Allow humanitarian access. If he does this, would be more than willing to talk to you and address issues peacefully because 
ultimately we are going to have uh, an all inclusive dialogue it could have in, you know it would it's just including him uh, bringing him into the dialogue as well it wouldn't have been a problem for us but he has to lift and he has to end what he is doing so he has refused uh, so he has really not given uh, a chance for friends to support him and for us even to support him. He has denied us all. He has desperately denied us all a chance to uh, end this uh, tragedy uh, and uh, catastrophe and genocide uh, peacefully. So it's... Uh, if he comes uh, with us, then uh, we we'll definitely talk to him. Uh, in regards to the parliament, I think it's uh, it's understandably clear. Uh, such parliament that has been uh, coming up with such decisions, all the decisions that you know, is unacceptable. Uh, And the Council of Ministers is definitely going to be unacceptable. There have to be others that have to take over. One thing that I would like to tell you is Tigray does not have the intention of taking power and dominating and so on. These are illusion. There is no interest of doing such things. Uh, as, we, as we said, there will be inclusive political process. We want to bring peace uh, to, the, to the nation, to the region. And so that we would be able to address the problems that we have peacefully. Uh, so this is what I can say. And uh, with the others, there will definitely be accountability uh, with the criminal uh, elements and criminal institutions have to account for that. And definitely we will work with uh, the UN and others in investigation, we want them to investigate into the crimes that have been committed very, very seriously. So this is what I can say for the moment. Some of the details have to come a little bit later. Uh, I do understand that I haven't gone in some of the uh, issues that you have raised, but it's not deliberate uh, because I have opinion, but uh, you know it has to be agreed amongst all the parties and they are working on that. So I, I'm uh, keeping it aside for, uh, for a very short period of time. And uh, we should come back to you on the details. But we are seriously working on all these issues and seriously working based on international standards as well, or based on international law and international standards. That's what, that I can assure you. Thank you, Ambassador. Before we go to the second question, since your name came up, Dr. Eleni, just wave and say hello, since you are with us. Uh, do, do you want to say a, a greeting to everybody? <laughs> your name came up in Ambassador's uh, talk. Okay, thank you, Professor. I really don't have much to say, just that uh, it's been a long time since I've uh, interacted with PDCI, um, and it's a pleasure to be back today and uh, to see all of our friends from the former diplomatic community. It's also a great honor to hear from Ambassador Brahana Gabra Christos, uh, for whom I have deep respect, and uh, to encourage him in the work that he's doing. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move forward, our friends. Can I make um, a couple of questions? Um, Basar Kalark, yes. Firstly, um, it's a huge honor and privilege to, to see you, um, Ambassador Bahani. It's, you haven't changed at all. Uh, I'm really impressed to how you've kept your youthful appearance and <laughs> as articulate uh, and as convincing as ever, I have to say. Um, hugely impressed by your analysis. Um, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head. For me, as you've correctly said, I believe, the two key issues are whether you go for a unitary form of a government or, or federal state. And I think 
We've said on previous conversations uh, with Professor Ephraim that it would be very interesting if there was some sort of inclusive proof process to look at these issues, because clearly this is a, an ongoing matter and it's not an easy solution at sight. Uh, but I do believe that uh, at the end of the day, a resolution of that is fundamental to a resolution of the discussions ongoing at the moment. Secondly, you put your finger absolutely on, on the pulse. You say this is a political issue and it's politicians that have to find solutions. It cannot be solutions through uh, warfare or um, civil war. It has to be the polit politicians that take leadership and find solutions that spare ordinary citizens in Ethiopia from the sort of disasters that they faced over the last few months. And I really th uh, think that your emphasis on finding a political solution is absolutely, I think, shared by all of us who are watching the tragedy unfold from afar. And it's political leadership from those who are involved and those outside that will ultimately depend, will determine whether or not Ethiopia can return to the sort of miraculous economic progress that you mentioned at the beginning of your, your debate. And um, for me, I, it was a real irony for me that someone who I respected and uh, at the beginning of his, uh, his uh, position as prime minister, as a Nobel Prize winner, when uh, holding out the, the hand of friendship across Ethiopia and of course to Eritrea as well, has led Ethiopia into this incredible chaos now that those who love Ethiopia from outside find themselves witnessing and powerless to do anything about. Which brings me really to my, my third comment is that, um, and we've raised this with Professor Ephraim before, you have on this call people who know Ethiopia, who love in Ethiopia, who've invested their time and their energy and their emotions and their hearts in Ethiopia. And we've asked many times, do we have anything useful to do? All of us in our own way, of course, still maintain contacts with our former employees. Just the other day, I was talking to the existing EU ambassador to, to Ethiopia. So all of us have connections of one sort or another, but actually we don't really know what to do with them. <laughs> um, and of course the, the, the issue as we've discussed many times is Ethiopians have to solve the problem themselves. Maybe they have to find their own internal mediators and not rely on the African Union or anyone else. So my question to you really is a critical one here. Can the Ethiopian politicians, the body politic, find a solution by themselves? Or do they need some form of outside assistance, help, support, whatever? And if so, what should that support be? Is it in the form of institutional support from nations or bodies such as the AU? Or is it individuals? Um, or what? What do you think as a an extremely seasoned the diplomat as you are, what is the correct way <laughs> or the, the solution that's most likely to lead to a solution to this ongoing tragedy without any more lives being lost? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, my good friend, team. Um, it's uh, Great pleasure to see you. It's been uh, it's been a while, and uh, very good to see you. You're uh, in good shape as well, in good spirit, and in good shape. Uh, <laughs> I look forward to uh, having conversation face to face uh, sometime in the future. Uh, continue our uh, uh, our, uh, our friendship and uh, our relationship. 
I can say that I think you've raised uh, very important issues. Definitely the nature of the problem is political. We shouldn't have gone to war. Uh, it was just a uh, reckless one. I agree the prime minister had great support from Ethiopians. I remember when he visited Matale, the early days, it was his second visit. He visited Somalia, Somali region. And after the Somali region, he visited, uh, uh, he visited, uh, after the Somali region, he visited Tigray. In his visit to Tigray, he was not even, I know there were around 3,000 people. Uh, you know, he talked to 3,000 people. He visited some areas, but he had conversation with 3,000 people. He gave a speech and he was not able to finish his speech. There was applause and after applause and after applause. And leaders in Tigray, TPLF leaders, local government leaders, were extremely, extremely happy to see him. I assure you the TPLF was there and the government of Tigray was there to support him to succeed. There should not be any doubt about it. Once he was elected, they were there to support him. I'm not, going, I'm not going to tell you the uh, support that he enjoyed uh, overseas. You've seen it and uh, you have done it yourself as well. Every Ethiopian did that. And every good friend of Ethiopia did that. Almost all nations supported him. But due to the reasons I mentioned earlier in my opinion, in my sincere opinion, due to the reasons I mentioned, he drove Ethiopia into this quagmire. A quagmire that's not easy. Ethiopia is today divided. Ethiopia is today fragmented. Ethiopia today is polarized. He asked me about, uh, you know, mediators. It's, well, I mean, this is a country of 110 million people and there are responsible individuals and uh, personalities uh, and level-headed uh, elements from, from all sectors of Ethiopia, Amharas, Tigrians, Oromos, Kambatas, Walaitas, mentioned from 80 groups. There are reasonable and level-headed uh, Ethiopians, for sure. But I can't tell you the level of... Uh, polarization. It is unbelievable. And this is because, you know, a head of state pushing for polarization, working day and night, whenever he speaks, whether it's in parliament, whether it's to media, whether it's to group, whether he speaks in different languages, message is divisive. Top from him down to the officials. If a leader does that, everybody follows definitely as it is. So it's very difficult to have this. But what I could say is, at least at this moment, to bring Avi into addressing problems, he has to be pushed from the international community. I don't think he would care anymore about the uh, local constituency. Of course, he doesn't care much about the uh, international community as well as he should be, but maybe better than the local one. Of course, Isaias would uh, be the most listened person uh, as he's in uh, control of Ethiopia. Uh, but uh, so it's, it's very difficult. Uh, at this moment, yes, I think if the atmosphere changes, if Abi is not willing to address these issues, and if, I, I'm not going to say if, when Abi is removed, which is going not, hopefully not going to be a long, long time, if he insists 
uh, doing what he is doing, then definitely he has to be ejected out. If he is ejected out, then conditions has to be condition have to be created for Ethiopians to address their problems. Definitely, there will be a need of, you know, friends uh, support this process. Uh, Ethiopia will need a lot of support, uh, whichever outcome might have our dialogue and so on, we have to dialogue and address our problems ourselves and we need to be supported by our friends. What kind of support when time comes, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can work on the details, but definitely there will always be need for, uh, for support. Uh, so what I, what I would say is now to end the war, Pressure on Avi or pressure on anybody that refuse would be important. But I should, I should assure you, on the part of the opposition, they have no problem. These are the nine groups that I mentioned. Most of them have presence on the ground. It's militarily. Their capability varies, but they have activities on the ground. I don't see any problem on the part of these groups to see it and address problems. Uh, so, uh, but after uh, change, I think if he does not, if he's not forthcoming after change, then I think we can create an atmosphere where we can sit and dialogue. The dialogue is not going to be easy, but there is no way out. We have to dialogue amongst ourselves. We have to dialogue what happened why did we go into, 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 into this situation? There are different interpretations. Let them be. But we have to talk. And we have to discuss how we can get out of this problem. Through this, we, whether we agree or not, definitely there will be points of convergences. And we have to build on the point of convergences. This is what we need to do. So I assure you, we'll, uh, we are committed to doing this. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Bob Dewar from London has just joined us. Say hello, Ambassador Brani. Ambassador Dewar. Ambassador Dewar, how are you? <laughs> hello, Ambassador Bob, you're mute. Yes. Well, no, it's a, a pleasure to be, to be able to, to see you and uh, to participate. I apologize for uh, not being here throughout because of technical problems. Um, I'm actually, my email is completely out. I'm able to uh, get to this meeting uh, via the internet, but, but not on, on, through the normal links. So I do apologize for that. And I've been listening with, um, with considerable interest to um, what I've uh, heard since, since uh, participating. And I agree, I agree with what Tim has been saying. And, um, and I'm very interested in what the ambassador is saying. So, I, but I can't contribute very much more at the moment because I wasn't present at the beginning, but very nice to be present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you. before we proceed, let me just say, Ambassador Brahane, uh, yes, we have a lot of international friends and I'm really very pleased to say that these ambassadors here today and their friends have been talking with our peace organization for now several months they love Ethiopia, they had great experience in that country, and they want the best for Ethiopia. So I think this group of ambassadors are themselves uh, in line to cooperate with us, to promote peace. If I said something wrong, uh, Ambassador uh, Vicky, who's been here all the time, can correct me. Ambassador Stefan, Ambassador Yamamoto, you can correct me, but I really do believe this group of uh, former emissaries have a very important role to play in the future of Ethiopia. Okay, any other comments uh, from our other friends? May I say a few words? Oh, please, Ambassador Christie. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it is really the first time I'm, I'm joining you <clears throat> on this, this group, but have been on the background all the time. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> I thank you very much for, for all the analysis that you have, you all have given. And I, I agree to, to most of that. Uh, it has been very painful to see what is happening in Ethiopia. 
since since we left because I think we all have been following it uh, all this time. And then, of course, the hopes were very, very high when um, when the peace peace was established between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and somehow it it was like a miracle. It didn't real it it didn't seem real first, and uh, and then of course we we believed that it happened and that there was a peace Nobel Peace Prize and everything, and then suddenly, the country is at war within itself which which is somehow unbelievable and so tragic mm. and uh, i i fully agree that this is a, the only way out is the political way out war is never going to uh, lead us to peace in the end it is through negotiations and um, as much as we would like to contribute there are always limits being outside of the country and, and being, being really only, only friends of Ethiopia. But we are not uh, established there. And, uh, and uh, of course, we don't want to interfere. We just want to, the best for, for Ethiopia. And, uh, and it has been really very, very difficult. Uh, the statements at this point play no role whatsoever. So there has to be something concrete. And I was also wondering about uh, the negotiators, peace negotiators, and all that. Uh, it looks like uh, President of Ajanda, of Asanjo, is, is best positioned at the moment. But do you see any other uh, possibilities? Do you think that outsiders can really be of, of help, or does it have to come from inside? And then, of course, uh, it's always. Um, always difficult to take the first step but uh, is there who is going to take the first step to get the negotiations going on have you established those uh, requests that you have to the government and have they ignored them or or are they are they is there any kind of contact between uh, the government and Tigray at the moment Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, raising these important issues, Ambassador. Uh, indeed, uh, when uh, the agreement between uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea was signed, I think a lot of people were extremely happy. Uh, uh, Integrate as well. There was uh, should be I should be frank to tell you that there was a bit of doubts uh, of the intention, but basically supported it uh, with caution. But came up to a conclusion within a short period of time knowing the intents of that agreement. The intent of that, first of all, I for one have been, had been engaged on issues of peace with Eritrea prior to 2018, actively engaged, working on uh, proposals and so on, as well as with, with other members. So, there were proposals, there were positions that would enable to address the problem between Ethiopia and Eritrea prior to 2018, which Isaias was aware, but not willing to uh, take that offer. When Abi came, no change at all of position. He said the same things that uh, the EPRDF was saying. And they signed an agreement. Their discussion was solely on one issue. That was on how to destroy Tigray and the TPLF. That was the only issue that they discussed. They never discussed border. 
They never discussed any other issue or difficulties or problems between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Never. It concentrated solely on Tigray and on the TPLF, on how to wage war. war. This was uh, a war pact, literally. And they started preparing simultaneously their defense forces. You know what type of defense forces both countries have. So that's what they started doing. And Isas has stated that openly to the media and the Eritrean public and uh, uh, to the international community, saying that the issue of border is not an issue. It is how to wash away Tigray and TPLF. That's what he stated repeatedly, repeatedly. Uh, so this has been the uh, center of their discussion, unfortunately. Uh, so you're right uh, to be surprised to see that uh, this agreement, which uh, generated a lot of enthusiasm and uh, uh, optimism, turned to uh, to be uh, to be to dis to, to to disappear. Uh, on the negotiations, I think for, for, you know at this point it's critical that. Uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, international actors, especially President Obasanjo has been playing a central role here. Uh, he's been trying his best and he's been supported by everybody. And definitely Kenya as well has been trying, uh, President Kenyatta has been trying as well on his part and, uh, and so on. So there has been serious uh, attempts here, but there is no response from Addis. There has been continuous rejection. There has been hesitance even to see them. Uh, some, most of the times, emissaries are not, or invoices are not, or high representatives are not received. Uh, so there is no willingness to address this problem peacefully. The reason is, reasons that I mentioned, I believe they're not going to do that. The reason is they have committed so much heinous crime. They have committed genocide. As I have started to learn about genocides, the genociders do not stop once they start the action. They have to finish it. No matter what capabilities they have, they have to finish it. That's what the experts say. That's what the experts tell me. So I think that's what they are doing. They are not willing to, to do so. I hope and pray that they accept and we go and we go to dialogue and at least save few lives and uh, uh, save distractions as well. But I think the president of Asanjo is um, well suited for this and he has to be supported. Uh, is, has there been any contacts uh, with uh, the government? You know, what they did was, you know, they characterized the TPLF as a terrorist organization. This is laughable. This is laughable. Uh, naming uh, uh, Tigray and the TPLF as terrorists is just a joke. This has a proven record of uh, uh, standing for justice, and uh, it, it has its own shortcomings. I mean, it's, it's operating under uh, difficult circumstances. I am not saying whatever was done was uh, perfect. Uh, but I think in terms of terrorism, <laughs> no way that one can implicate the TPLF on this or the uh, people of the Bay on this. They did this so that to block dialogue. So there is no contact, unfortunately, with the uh, Abiy administration. Abiy administration has completely shut uh, opportunities for uh, dialogue. Okay, thank you. Now, by the way, Ambassador Vicky and Ambassador Yamamoto, you have not said a word. <laughs> um, oh, Ambassador uh, Christie, you wanted to say something more? Thank you very much. No, that's all. Well, 
we haven't heard from Ambassador Vicky or Ambassador Donald. Uh, uh, this is Don. Just a, a quick question. So, uh, Ato Burhani, it's, it's really a, a great honor, and again, our deepest condolences on the tragedies in Tigray and and the loss of life. And and we were in contact with many of the people right before the tragedy began, and and the death is just is unacceptable. What you're raising is it raises a lot of questions and issues, and and in some ways, I don't, I don't really disagree with you. And that is that um, will Abi actually um, change? Will he negotiate? Will he actually uh, move forward um, and cut off his dependence on Isaiah and others? And that that's that's really hard. But you know, given where the international community is, and especially after Secretary Blinken's visit to the continent, and you have Sudan, which continues to be a problem, uh, and of course Ethiopia is challenged with um, Egypt on the. Um, uh, on the um, Renaissance Dam issue. And of course you have to succession problems and bad elections coming up in Kenya, Somalia and the other areas. Um, there's, everyone is really looking at some type of negotiated settlement or some way forward to resolve and avoid the, the anticipated violence with troops now right outside of Addis. As you know, the evacuations have begun. Uh, that, that's a very alarming situation. and. There is just, just a lot of problems. Is there anything that you see that can really, are you engaged in any other alternative mechanisms that's going to kind of resolve this ongoing challenge over? Thank you. Are we, are we engaged in uh, an alternative? What, what, what's the point that you said last? Yeah, so other mechanisms, because obviously just, Making conditions on Abi is not going to. Abi is not listening. He is not listening at all right now. And and how are you going to reach him to a person who's really in a corner? Um, and Obasanjo has not been extraordinarily helpful or very active. And so, are there any other opportunities uh, that you see? I th I think the the key is with Isaiah. And the second key, the lower key, is with uh, Abi. It's them who have to make it happen or unhappen. Uh, unfortunately, um, I think the international community tried its maximum best to advise, to support, to encourage Abi to do the right thing. Going out of their way. Going out of their way. Which is appreciated uh, uh, on our side. Uh, the attempt and the uh, all that is appreciated. But refused. The choice is to stick with Isaiah's either live together or die together. They have become inseparable. The reason is the crimes that they have committed. He's not, you know, Abi is not put in a box. He could have decided a bit earlier and engage himself in negotiations. He could do it today. Tomorrow is going to be much more difficult and different. Definitely, it's going to be different, not uh, like today. So it's, in my opinion, they are, they are aware of what they are doing. They have chosen this road, route. Is there any other alternative? The, the choice are two. I mean, one is dialogue, which they have refused. The other one is put us in a desperate situation where genocide has been committed. So we have to save our lives. We have lost so many members of our families. We have lost so many friends. We have lost so many family members. There are people who lost around 16, 18, 20, 25 members of their family 
family members. So we have to, you know, so we'd, 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 we'd be happy to see a peaceful uh, resolution of this problem. But if we are denied, then we have to defend ourselves. No choice. Uh, so what I can say is alternatives have, I don't know if there are any other alternatives, I would uh, be happy to learn, but these are the two alternatives. And uh, Tigray has been pushed to choose the bad alternative, an alternative that it does not like. And that's, that's defending oneself. If there is any other view, I mean, I would like to learn anytime. If there is any other alternative, I would be more than happy to learn and see a different alternative. But the best alternative is addressing this peacefully through dialogue, which Avi has refused and desires above all, doesn't like. Thank you. Ambassador Vicky, we have not heard from you. You are mute. Well, yes, I, I realized that. And thank you, Ambassador, for your time and, and uh, ex excellent explanation. I actually was kind of going to avoid saying very much because I, I find it tragic and uh, disturbing and I don't see an easy solution. But let me ask you uh, two questions that I think are kind of leading questions. Um, First about your military strategy. Uh, it, it appears to me with your approach to Addis and your movement to the corridor leading to Djibouti, uh, your uh, military is doing everything possible to uh, force uh, Abdi to step down. And maybe it seems very difficult to get Isaiah to pull out his armies. So is that the strategy? and? Is it the best strategy? Because yeah, would there be another strategy that would open a corridor, military strategy for a humanitarian corridor? And um, the second question is, I couldn't agree more that, you know, Abdi should sh step down. There should be a, an all-inclusive transition government. But I think I worry because, you know, the Tigrayans, yourself and uh, the leaders in Tigray have been very effective um, in uh, carrying out the conflict and fighting back. And to me, that sort of means that uh, Tigray, Tigrayans will be in charge of a new government. And as confident uh, as you are, and uh, uh, the fact that you could probably do an excellent job. Still, I think that that probably would be a huge mistake. Um, so I don't know if you could comment on those, those two questions. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Ambassador Vicky. Thank you very, very much uh, for these important questions. As usual, you have uh, raised important issues. Uh, first of all, in regards to the military strategy, uh, our choice is definitely our priority of priority is saving lives of uh, the Tigran people from genocide. This is a priority of priority. So we would have loved to see Tigray uh, and the people of Tigray are not under genocidal uh, act and situation. In this case, we would have, you know, to come to your question, maybe if you're referring to the Western Corridor to open humanitarian access, definitely we would have loved uh, to do that because it gives us a lot of advantage. One, relieve uh, people from genocide. As we speak, uh, yesterday evening, actually, they took uh, 
less than 100, I guess, people towards Takazi, the river Takazi. What they do is they kill them on Takazi River. Uh, they kill them and throw their bodies into Takazi River. This is classical uh, genocidal act. They have done that repeatedly. And yesterday evening, they took some Takazi. Uh, I didn't hear whether they've been killed, but it looked like that they were going to kill them near the river. This is from Western Tigray. So for us, it would have been, uh, our choice would be definitely to free our people in the western part of Tigray, the Humara area, from genocide. However, this is a military uh, theater, military affairs. You don't go to areas that you want. Our intention is definitely to push the military out of Tigray and create a condition where at the same time they are not able to uh, invade and create, you know, continue with their genocidal act. But we have to definitely chase and we have to we have to we have to encounter the mobilization as well. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to do many you know we are taking many factors into consideration. One relieving people from genocide, two break the blockade because a blockade is killing people. It's part of the genocidal uh, game. And people are dying due to lack of food, due to lack of medicine, due to lack of services, and so on. So we have to, we have to break the blockade and the siege. Thirdly, there is big mobilization. If we don't deal with it, it's going to be a serious military problem and security problem again to the people of Tigray and to other Ethiopians as well. It's not only in Tigray that we have war. We have in Oromia, we have in Ago, we have in Kaman, we have everywhere. Everywhere, literally everywhere in Ethiopia today, we have uh, wars. So, so that the strategy is definitely not giving a chance to the regime to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people and again conduct a genocide. So it takes all this into consideration. Definitely, we want to open a corridor, but it doesn't go with our uh, desire. It goes, we can open it by pushing militarily because in a peaceful way, Everybody tried on, to have a corridor opened. Um, UN tried, NGOs tried, governments tried, the EU tried, the US tried. Everybody failed to have it open. So we are forced to open it. And in order to open it, we have to weaken the military establishment of the, of the invading forces. So the strategy, our strategy is dictated by the action of the invading forces. This is what I can say. It's not, uh, it doesn't depend on only on our choice, but it's dictated by the situation. I hope I have uh, re responded to your uh, question. In terms uh, of uh, all-inclusive dialogue, we are going to have all-inclusive dialogue. I, I should assure you that we have no interest of uh, of dominating Addis and uh, 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 and so on. This is this is not the case. This is not the agenda. This is not the issue. Uh, we want to have uh, an all-inclusive dialogue, and uh, we want to see how we can address uh, problems, and we want to address it through that mechanism. So I should assure you that we are not interested in uh, uh, in controlling Addis and so on. Uh. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent explanation. I, uh, I hope that uh, 
you'll have military success fairly soon because it seems as if the situation is uh, only becoming more drastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so very, very much, all of you. Now, uh, can I, can I ask you? Yes. Yeah, two more, two more questions quickly. Sorry yes. to take the floor again. The case, John. <laughs> yeah. First, first question. Uh, even if Abi sticks to his guns, which unfortunately he seems to be doing, do you, is there hope that some people around him, either in government or in the military, uh, realize that this is going nowhere and might force him to, well, to accept, to accept cessation of hostilities or force him to step down? That's number one. Second question, uh, I'd like to go back to this issue of uh, crime and accountability, which is perfectly understandable, especially for the, uh, for the for the victims. But would it be envisageable at a certain stage to have some kind of, uh, I don't know how to call it, to amnesty or pardon or yukerta whatsoever, in order to precisely to encourage the other side to to give to to give up this useless fight? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no good questions again. Um, well, uh, there are people that realize that this is not going anywhere uh, from the government side. I should say there should be, but very, very few. Uh, the atmosphere is, you know, uh, how can I explain that? If I may refer the Second World War, what happened in the Second World War, hurt of Europe, that kind of political atmosphere is there in Ethiopia. The demagogy, the rhetoric, and so on is identical. No, it's frightening. Identical. No difference of whatsoever. The wording in basically are the same. Uh, I think that uh, needs to be taken into consideration. So people have gone with the wave. Talking to your friends, you can see the you can see the polarization. Some that you knew a few years ago, talking to them today, you see that they have most of them have lost their sense of balance mm. and their sense of rationalization. They are irrational. They are totally partial. They belong to the sack that they came in from, and they cannot even see out of the sack that they are in, that they think they are in, uh, which means they think about the kings that they come from. They don't see beyond that. So it is, it is in a way, in its unique way, it's similar to what happened during the Second World War. This is what I can say. Secondly, the unique situation in Ethiopia is, with no exaggeration, Ethiopia is fully controlled by Isaias. The military is controlled by Isaias, by Eritrea. Secret services are controlled by Isaias. Immigration is controlled by Isaias. Financial sector is controlled by Isaias. He has ripped off Ethiopia fully, fully. He is in control. This makes it difficult for good, uh, for people who have good intention to act. 
because this brutal uh, uh, institution from Eritrea and the one that has become extremely brutal and trying to keep, keep pace with Eritrean brutality, the Ethiopian part, these are merciless today. And the prime minister has full control at this moment. No one can, cannot uh, move outside of uh, his will. So what has happened is, you know, this is the situation that we are uh, operating uh, at in, uh, in Addis and uh, in Ethiopia. So this makes it difficult for people who have good intention to act. In the military, to be honest with you, I don't see any, anything coming out of it. There are generals, but you don't have soldiers. You don't have even officers. Uh, and the generals are in many aspects meaningless incompetent and so on and so forth. Uh, there are few who, are, who could be competent, but most of them are incompetent. So what I would say is, I don't see anything coming out of this, primarily due to the two reasons I mentioned, the Second World War kind of situation and the Eritrean control. Last question is the issue of um, crime, accountability, and, uh, and so on. Uh, I think, well, justice has to be served. Uh, the truth has to come out. And definitely all of us have to learn out of this. Uh, so there will be uh, mechanisms that will be put in place, but uh, we'll, we'll try to do it in a, in a, in a responsible way. Uh, there is no issue of uh, vendetta and so on and so forth. I should assure you that uh, the Tigrayan fighters, uh, the TDF members who are operating in different parts of Ethiopia have kept uh, their uh, mind clear. They are not engaged in any sort of vendetta. They know who did these problems. They don't attribute it to, to other groups or to other peoples. That's why they have been supported by the, by the people in Amhara mm -hmm. and in Afar. So, and in 1991, you remember what kind of brutality we had in Ethiopia in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. There was no retribution. There was no, there was no vendetta. Uh, so I assure you that uh, we'll try to do everything possible to have accountability and uh, justice. And uh, um, people of Ethiopia learn out of this, and uh, they, so that they can live in peace. If something goes wrong here, we know what the consequences are. The consequences are going to be grave. So. So far, we have gone into deep catastrophe. If we are going to get out, we have to do things responsibly in the future. And I assure you, it would be done very, very responsibly, given the circumstance uh, that we get into. We have 10 more minutes left. Um, if there are still our friends who would like to bless us with their thinking, with their enlightenment, with their questions, we have 10 more minutes. Uh, oh, you want to say something? If possible, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> This is a forum for our international friends, but she is a key member of our peace organization, so she has the right to express herself. <laughs> well, I, I think it's relevant for the international friends. Um, we have heard from various, you know, sources and analyses that, you know, Ethiopia has gone back 30 to 40 years. Uh, Ambassador Brahani, you spoke of, you know, going back to the Stone Age. So one of the things post transition or part of transition is the reconstruction, the economic reconstruction of Ethiopia. 
uh, and some form of a Marshall Plan. So I, my question to you, uh, Ambassador Brahani, is have, uh, obviously there are many other pieces that you're focused on, but to what extent has there been some kind of an estimation um, of the extent of the Marshall Plan uh, that would be required to bring Ethiopia back to even where we were three years ago. So that's my first question. The second one is alongside that, beyond the political arrangement of the transitional uh, arrangement and pr prior to that, the provisional administration that you described, what um, in, in your view would be also a plan for the social reconstruction, the fabric that has been completely torn apart. Uh, of course, you, you, we jokingly refer to, uh, or not so jokingly, but you know, my grandfather, Gabramettin, indeed that is a name ascribed to Tigrayans, but also to Amharas. Uh, as, as my grandfather moved from Northern Shoa to Walaita Sordo, where he married my grandmother, uh, and brought up my father and my um, aunts and uncles in Sordo. So now we are at a point of such a polarization in my family. I see that for polarization. And uh, so the question is not only the political arrangements, but how we will come back together as a society. And some might even question whether we were ever together as a society, uh, because um, it's almost um, frightening to me how quickly the unitarist perspective took hold. And although you described it as an ultra-nationalist Amhara base, it exists nonetheless. And we have to do something about it. And I have in my own family those who you might describe in that way. So the question is, how do we come back together? Uh, because otherwise there is a real fear that we cannot continue as a country. And so um, we need to really go beyond the political arrangement. And I don't, we don't have much time to address this, but mm -hmm. I think that's really the question on the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Lenny. Well, uh, thank you, Lenny, who have uh, raised very, very, very important issue again here. Uh, you know, in regards to the uh, rehabilitation and reconstruction, uh, in regards to need of Marshall Plan, I think uh, the, first of all the destruction is uh, heavy. Uh, in the case of Tigray, it's literally it's a Stone Age. A number of clinics are very few. Uh, today you don't have even medication. Uh, people who need dialysis, I'm mentioning dialysis just as an example. There is no one sack of medication of dialysis. So people are dying. Any mention, any type of medication, diabetic and uh, diabetes and any, any kind of uh, sickness and medication, there is no drug at all. Uh, so uh, people are dying. And at any rate, the infrastructure has been completely demolished, completely looted primarily, uh, and the rest demolished. Uh, so now there has been um, mm, they have been auditing, they have been working on uh, the figures of the level. The, there has been damage assessment uh, being undertaken now. So they are working on it. Uh, not only in Tigray, but in other parts as well, has to be worked out because the destruction is primarily in Tigray, but it's all over the nation. So uh, the ass assessment has been undertaken. A good part of it has been worked out, but some remains to be to be completed uh, because some of the territories are not easy easily accessible at this moment, and the government does not allow this to take place. So it has to be done as soon as possible. And once we have an all-inclusive political process, it should help us somehow to reasonably, reasonably calm down the situation and build on that. 
So the understanding and support of the international community would be very important. I think definitely all of you here have a role, great role to play on that. Uh, as friends of Ethiopia and as people who understand Ethiopia, I think you will uh, you will put all your efforts to make this happen uh, in regards to the Marshall Plan uh, in particular. So it's been worked out. That's what I can say. Uh, but it's extensive. It's just, it's complex and it's a lot of work that's needed. In regards to uh, the social. Uh, well, you're absolutely right. The polarization is unbelievable. Uh, and definitely what you said is correct. A uh, lot of people say, have we lived together? Have we been one nation? Uh, you know, it's kind of common question amongst uh, many Ethiopians. You've uh, clearly put it, you know, uh, people are asking whether we had been united, we had been one nation. And uh, the uh, the opinion of having independent state and cessation has risen uh, the last uh, three years. At least what I can say is, in 1990s, this was a serious problem that we had in Ethiopia. By 2000, 2010, people who advocated for independence throughout their life changed their opinion and started to say independence. Uh, but now, Within a short period of time, within three years, people have started to, uh, to have opinion of independence. They desire to be independent, to have independent states. And the level of skepticism that they have on union is unbelievable. Unbelievable. So the challenge that we have is huge. But what we need to do is we need to sit, dialogue openly, see what happened. It's going to be very difficult, not easy, uh, not easy process, but it needs patience, it needs wisdom, uh, and we have to have open, very open forum for the actors. And the debate, the constructive part of the debate uh, and explaining contexts, I think people have to take part in it as well. Media has to play a different role that it is, than it is playing today because the media, be it the public or the private, have become extremely destructive. They are pushing for polarization today. But when we do a process of dialogue begins, I think they have to try to heal the process as much as possible. I cannot say fully that we'll succeed, but there is no option. We have to try and we have to work hard uh, to make sense to ourselves and see the problems that we are in and how we can get out together. So it's going to be a tough job. I think we have to come up with detailed plans on this. I think people are working on it. Hopefully we'll have a debate on that. And you and uh, all of you have, should have a role in this, uh, you know, in articulation of, uh, uh, in articulation of how we should deal with this. I think a great participation of people like yourself would be, would be important too. Thank you so very, very much. If there is any other urgent question, we can take one more question. Otherwise, shall we conclude? OK. Uh, in conclusion, let me also put my pennies worth of ideas. Apropos the last question Dr. Eleni asked. Uh, the other week, the BBC interviewed me about this very same question. Would the people of Ethiopia ever live in peace together? 
I said, as an incorrigible optimist, actually I'm nowadays a little bit corrigible optimist, yes. And I, I, th I explained by saying that the problem is among us, the cream of 1% of Ethiopian elites. I think if we start willing to be willing to dialogue with each other, to forgive each other and to say past are gone, the people of Ethiopia have no problem with each other. I have traveled all over Ethiopia, Amhara, Tigre, Oromo. They do not ask me, are you Amhara, Tigre, or Oromo? They ask me, you must be tired, come and have coffee. And I remember five years ago, I was in uh, Wukro in Tigray, and we're, we're going to look at the excavations. And I saw a couple of women carrying babies in their hands and then heavy uh, firewood on their back. And they were very curious and said, Oh, please, uh, you look like tired. Uh, please come in and have coffee. So what I'm saying is I'm basically a, a corrigible optimist that the people of Ethiopia have no problem with each other. The people of Ethiopia are intermarried. I have a neighbor here who's Amhara and his wife is Tigra. She just had a baby a month ago. They called it Caleb by the way, <laughs> Caleb. And, and everybody I know, even in my own family, there's a lot of, so the people of Ethiopia, the people, but the elites are the problem. And I do believe, however, I, I do not mean to say the elites are terrible, but the elites need to talk to each other. It is, that is where the problem will be solved. This cream of 1% of Ethiopians who have been educated in the West, who happened to have had the power, who had had the money, who had the authority in, in the country, we have to find a way. And that's where our international friends can help us because these are the people you know. These are the people you are in touch with. Meaning this 1% el educated elite, if we, to, and, and also I respect them too, but they need to talk to each other and come to really understand each other. Finally, I will say, Look at France and Germany. Uh, Ambassador Gompers well, is my witness. The Germans and the French don't really hate each other today, but look at the horrible war that existed between them. Look at America and Japan. Ambassador Yamamoto and Ambassador Vicky will witness with that. America bombed, atomic bomb, the Japanese, Japan. But America and Japan today are buddy buddies, great friends. So. I am looking at the overall human situation that if those of us who have the education, the, the, the political power, and who have the authority of, of leadership, if we can sit down together and really uh, uh, follow our own tradition of forgiving each other and our own tradition of coming together uh, with mutual respect, and with understand for the sake of the 99% of the people who want nothing but butter bread, they want to bring up their children in peace, they want schools, they want hospitals, and that's what the people want. Whether you go to Tigray, Amhara, or Oromo, that's what I hear myself. That is why Ambassador Abrahane, I hope you don't mind my optimism. <laughs> I, I, I am partly, of course, pessimistic uh, in terms of I own my own very close friends uh, who are uh, now intermarried. Sometimes I know a man, who, who, a doctor who's married to a Tigra and they're sleeping in different beds. So this is terrible. This is terrible. So we, we have to, concentrate on that 1% of the intellectual, the, the diaspora in Europe, in America, and the political leadership. Then the 99% of the people of Ethiopia are good-hearted people, humble people, religious people, kind people. So they will welcome peace. And so I am very, very thankful, Ambassador Brahane, for your really extremely eloquent delivery, <laughs> really, and very interesting analysis.
um, and I'm glad we invited you because I myself learned a lot today from the, the, what you had said, and I'm sure everybody uh, appreciated what you said. Uh, as Ambassador Tim Clark said, uh, uh, you, 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 your, your nuance, your, your way of delivery all is very impressive, Ambassador Brani. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much. And I appreciate your kindness, your friendship, and uh, I will, will, will continue to uh, uh, work together. Our dear friends, uh, I guess Ambassador Gurjit sent his greetings because he could not wake up <laughs> at night time. And then um, um, the Ambassador Rafael said he said he will come, but I don't know why he didn't show up. So anyway, I really am very happy. Maybe we can repeat this, Ambassador Brahane, if, if we need to, if you have the time. Um, if there is no question, if uh, somebody who wants to say goodbye, um, then we thank Ambassador Brahane. I'm sure every, on behalf of everybody, I want to say thank you very much, deeply, yes. deeply, and, uh, and we pray for Ethiopia. Uh, by the way, I'll just say one more word. You see why I'm an optimist. One of the people in my committee who, who had shown up, he, uh, I, I've, I think I have mentioned to all of you before, um, my, my good friend uh, uh, here, he, the picture of, you see that picture of uh, Virgin Mary? Uh, his name is Gabriel Ratta. Gabriel Ratta was a soldier of TPLF during the last war. He lost half his hand and three of his fingers. And now, He's a very spiritual person. He, he paints with two fingers and, and drives, uh, uh, holds a telephone with half of his two fingers. And you see, and he is one of the most conciliatory people I have met, very spiritual man. So people who, uh, that's why I become optimistic. When I see someone like that, who has many wounds on his body, yet he loves Ethiopia, he is from the North himself. Of course, he suffered uh, the uh, war. So that's why I'm an optimist that even those of us who have been, who have lost family, relatives, even those of us who have lost half of our hand, like Gabriel Ratta here, uh, we still, however, uh, are coming together and doing good things. There is Gabriel Ratta, the painter. He's an artist now. I'll show you two fingers. And he, is, he has only love in his heart. That's why he became a member of my committee. He has no hostility. He has no about the people who, who, who threw a bomb at him and, uh, and almost killed him. So that's why I'm an optimist. Thank you all very, very, very much. Thank you. I wish we have a song. We'll sing a song. Next time, maybe I'll revise the song. <laughs> so that it's a song of peace. But finally, our international friends, yes, please keep thinking how uh, you, are, you are lovers of Ethiopia, and that's why you are with us. Please keep thinking how we can get an international coalition group to help us. Is that all, my friends? Anybody? Did I not say enough? I spoke too much? Okay. Shall we say Thank goodbye? You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Oh, au revoir. Merci. Merci beaucoup pour tout, and we'll try to meet again. Thank you all. Thank you all. A bientôt. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Some of my Ethiopian friends want to stay for a few minutes. Um, okay. Maybe we can talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ambassador. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really, it was amazing what your delivery. Thank you. Thank you.